But it's wonderful to be here, and I'll be very grateful for everybody's uh, comments and criticism of a project which is very much still taking shape. On July 18, 1573, the Venetian Inquisition summoned Paolo Veronese to answer questions about the Last Supper that he had painted for the convent of Saints Giovanni and Paolo. Veronese had created a glorious tableau. Classical architecture frames Jesus and his disciples against a dramatic city and sky, while Hogarthian servants and soldiers talk and scuffle in the foreground. This glamorous dramatic image provoked only dry, precise queries. What signifies the figure of him whose nose is bleeding? And the one who's dressed as a jester with a parrot on his wrist, why did you put him into the picture? Veronese did his best to answer. The figure with the bleeding nose, he explained, is a servant who has a nosebleed from some accident. The jester with the parrot is there as an ornament, as it is usual to insert such figures. The inquisitors were not satisfied. They pointed out to the painter that Protestants had taken advantage of the presence of similar apocrypha in, in religious art to ridicule the Catholic Church. So they ordered Veronese to correct his picture by erasing the halberd ears and replacing the dog with Mary Magdalene. Veronese replied in his own way. He left the painting exactly as it was and retitled it The Feast in the House of Levi, a scene less freighted with theological significance. Now, by the time Veronese fell foul of the censors, he had already painted several Last Suppers. The fact that he could go so wrong from the standpoint of expert critics when working on a subject he knew so well shows just how theologically problematic the Last Supper, envisioning the Last Supper, could be in the middle and later years of the 16th century. And no wonder. On the one hand, the Reformation had made the nature of the Eucharist itself into the object of more violent theological debate than it had been for a millennium. On the other hand, representations of its origins were literally everywhere, since the Last Supper had become, in the 14th and 15th centuries, a central theme of religious art, often portrayed on a large scale and usually in convents and other settings of religious communities. Where, oops, aha, where, to give you the most famous example, designed to enable monks at their meals to imagine themselves taking part in the Last Supper. Across Europe, reformers wanted to make Catholicism more internal and meditative, to give monastic exercises of asceticism and penance a deeper internal meaning. The Last Supper was one of an array of devotional tools, designed partly to avert the sin of gluttony, but more positively to enable those who ate next to it to project themselves as they ate, to think themselves into Jesus's sparing, desperate last meal. And in order to promote this function, Last Suppers tended to be set in the present, or very nearly in the present, set in almost the kind of monastic community that the people who were using them inhabited. Decorum was essential. A rowdy and undisciplined Last Supper like Veronese's couldn't possibly do its devotional job. Any suggestion of irreverence could be dangerous. But I think particularly anything that pushed the Last Supper away from being the peaceful, monastic, contemplative experience that it usually was in the large scale was problematic. Now, food in this period, and one need hardly say this, at the Bard Graduate Center was also obviously highly contagious from the ascetic monasteries where these paintings lived to the lush gardens of bankers in the middle of Trastevere where gold dishes could be thrown into the Tiber after dinner to be pulled back up in fishnets in the middle of the night. Common meals were the core of Renaissance social life and every elegant, well-laid table was potentially a bloody crossroads where violations of decorum could make one an outcast from society, blowing one's nose and looking at the results as if they were pearls, for example, as Delacaza says so well. More generally, the table was where opposing ideals of austerity and consumption met and conflicted. Carnival and Lent, Bruegel's dream of repletion and Erasmus's dream of plain living and high thinking 
thinking, Rabelais gobbling giants and Delacaze's courtiers with their spiral linens beautifully folded for the occasion. Where did the Last Supper fit on the spectrum of possible forms of food and ways of dealing with food? What did Christ and the apostles eat and how much? What kind of bread did Jesus distribute? Now, deciding what actually happened at the Last Supper has never been simple um, for reasons that will become probably clearer in the course of this talk. And painters, of course, were not exactly specialists in ecclesiastical archaeology or artistic theory. Over the last thousand years, as B. and C. S. von Zink showed two years ago in a short but provocative article in the International Journal of Obesity, um, images of the Last Supper have represented the main dish served as lamb, which you might expect at Passover, 14% of the time, but as fish or eel, 18% of the time, and even as pork, 7% of the time. More remarkably still, if you follow the size of the dish, the portion served over time, <laughs> comparing the portions to the size of the heads of those at the table, you turn, it turns out that the food in front of Jesus and the disciples has expanded starkly over time, perhaps reflecting the greater prosperity that um, patrons and viewers enjoyed. So the painters engaged in this enterprise then were clearly not trying to carry out a work of scholarship in the first instance. The carefully chosen objects and the precisely depicted gestures that make these quiet images buzz with drama and that differentiate them and that I would be discussing were I an art historian were freighted with exegetical and theological meanings but much less with archeological and historical ones. Ghirlandaio, as Creighton Gilbert pointed out long ago, was not a biblical scholar. Actually, what he said was, Ghirlandaio was not Ernest Renan. He was not trying to reconstruct early Palestine. But that's the fascinating thing about the moment I'm concerned with. In the 15th and 16th centuries, scholarly understanding of scripture was radically transformed. Catholic and Protestant commentators accepted a new set of hermeneutical principles created by Erasmus and others. They agreed that the student of the New Testament must begin by setting the text back into its original context, must know what the words of the text had meant, what the settings of the text had looked like at the time when it was written. So what happened when scholars who were more or less Ernest Renan, or at least uh, looked forward to him, turned those shiny new tools on that shifting, shimmering, strange topic, the Last Supper? Well, start this inquiry in the Rome of the 1580s. Here, Cesare Baronio, oratorian and polymath, cardinal, <laughs> librarian of the Vatican, and only by his desperate efforts, not Pope in the early 17th century, was hard at work on the Annales Ecclesiastici, what Lord Acton calls the greatest history of the church ever written. And what came out in the end is 12 ant-like volumes that tell the story of the church from the birth of the savior to the end of the 12th century, document by document. Baronio rarely figures as a hero in modern histories of early modern scholarship. He set out, as the title page already suggests with its wonderful Peter and Paul, to show that the church was semper eadem, always the same, that the church of the first century and the church of the 16th were identical. This approach underpinned the entire work and it was nicely, though not of course intentionally, uh, uh, or, uh, ordered to enrage Protestants since Protestants had begun by insisting that the early church was precisely different from the church of their day, corrupt as it was, that it was a distant country to which only a radical reform of the church could allow Protestants and ideally all true Christians to return. Hence the 800 magnificent folio pages of the book on the right, the nastiest book review written in an era of bent nibs, Isaac Kasaubin's sacred exercises on the first half of volume one of Baronio's Annals. And Kasaubin was far from the only Protestant or the last one in whom Bar in Baronio's great book induced nausea. This is the attestation that Jonathan Swift left in his copy of the 12th volume. He whiled away the miseries of rustication in Dublin reading Baronio. 
the worst of the worst writers, the falsest of the false writers, the most trifling of the trifling writers, and the most tasteless of the tasteless writers. Thus, after reading all 12 volumes, I decided, caught up in a mixture of anger and boredom, Jonathan Swift, 1729. <laughs> but in fact, Baronio had his merits as a scholar. In his deep erudition, Joseph Scaliger, on whom I spent many years, said, every history is good, Baronio is good, I learn when I read him. And also in the methodological range of his work. He didn't specialize in the use of material remains, and there are relatively few illustrations in his books, but he did sometimes resort to them in order to understand particular problems. In order, for example, to illuminate the early history of the Eucharistic wafer, he obtained and represented an object more familiar to many people in this room than it was to most 16th century Catholics. This is a round matzah, a shura matzah, which he, he I always imagine him walking over to the ghetto, having some fiori di zucchini, buying a nice matzah at the baker. And he actually tells us, you can see this at the top, that he found a rabbi particularly expert in ancient Jewish matters to describe this to him. Why was he interested in this? Because he wanted to establish that the early Eucharist had been scored so that it would be easy to break. And he saw this as coming directly out of the matzah. And so he compared the matzah with this reproduction of an early Eucharist, which he took from a picture of a Roman relief. So here you see Baronio really taking, uh, taking a, a very independent and I think quite original approach to understanding the central ritual of early Christianity in material, in very literally material terms. And as you might expect from this one detail, if you look at his treatment of the Last Supper, you move from a world, the rather airless, cramped, crapulous world of religious polemic to something much more cosmopolitan. Baronio begins by making clear that in their treatment of the Last Supper, the synoptic gospels give only a skeletal narrative they concentrate on the vital moment, which is Christ's institution of the Eucharist and his declaration to the disciples that one of them would betray him. But in doing that, they omitted vital facts. And the vital facts they omitted were precisely that Jesus and his disciples had celebrated a full Passover Seder before the institution of the Eucharist described in the Gospels. So he begins by saying, to make everything plain, we think it vital to lay out a short account of the ancient customs followed by the Jews when they celebrated the Passover using both the scriptures and ancient authors. You'll note that he begins the, the substantive account by pointing out that the Jews dined in the Roman manner. They washed, they were anointed, they wore special clothing, and they reclined. So suddenly the Last Supper is not a Christian monastic supper, but something very different, both Jewish and Roman. He describes the actual service. For example, he gives you the great invitation with which the Magid section of, of Passover, which is the core of Passover, begins. This is the bread of affliction, which our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt. Whoever is hungry, let him come and celebrate the Passover. He goes through the blessings and explains the blessings that Jesus would have given and suggests that the Eucharistic blessings are not wholly new, but adapted, transformative, but still adapted from the blessings of the Passover ritual. And he ends by emphasizing that Jesus preserved these segments of the ancient Jewish ritual, even as he added new blessings to create a new sacrament. So suddenly the Last Supper itself has been transformed, transported back into a Jewish world, set and articulated in a radically new way. I wonder what Girlandaya would have said if he'd been asked to do a Last Supper in the style of Baronia, or more, more historically reasonably Veronese. Now, in making this argument, as Baronio himself made clear, he was drawing in part on the antiquarian scholarship of the last generation, as Anthony Blunt showed in a wonderful article very early in the history of the Warburg Institute Journal. In 1567, the Paduan doctor Girolamo Mercuriale published the first edition of his great treatise on the ancient art of gymnastics. 
Mercuriala had frequented the Farnese Circle in Rome, where he had come to know antiquaries. This is what antiquaries look like when they're socializing. <laughs> um, men like Piero Ligorio, who, who created what their contemporary Francesco Patrizzi called a new kind of history, history analytical rather than narrative in method, synchronic rather than diachronic in form, and resting on material rather than, or at least along with, written evidence. These were the first historians who entered the bloody crossroads where what we now call archaeology, ethnography, social, economic, and cultural history meet. Like many medical men, as Nancy Sarizi showed in her great book, Mercuriala connected his <coughs> medical and historical studies. And so in this book, he not only traces the history of physical exercise from Homeric Greece to Imperial Rome, but also gives advice, warning scholars against excess uh, exercise. Watch for that bicycle, Peter. It may be a bad idea. <laughs> Working in the exhaustive and encyclopedic manner that antiquaries preferred, moreover, he didn't confine himself to ex to exorbitant physical exercise, but inspected all kinds of bodily motions. He devoted a long chapter to dining customs, and there he published a relief which belonged to the famous Ramuzio family, the family of the publisher of the voyages in Padua, which represented Romans <coughs> dining as they actually did, in a triclinium <coughs> lying on three couches grouped in the shape of a U around the place where the food would be and allowing a central entrance for service. Mercuriala explained that Romans had reclined at table for health reasons. They steamed themselves in the bath before dinner until they were absolutely limp, and therefore they had to lie down at table because be, they would have been incapable of sitting up. And he remarks in passing that this is also how the Jews and Jesus and his disciples must have eaten. Now, Mercuriala's Roman acquaintances, Pedro Chacon and Fulvio Orsini, took the argument a little farther, and sadly not for the most uh, idealistic of reasons. In the last decades of the 16th century, as Ingo Herklotz and Will Stenhouse and others have taught us, scholarly patronage in Rome shifted. The cardinals whose ear trumpets scholars wanted to reach now were less interested in classical than in Christian antiquity. They wanted to hear from men like Bozio, the Columbus of the catacombs, about what early Christian art and ritual had looked like. And classical scholars had to show that they had something to offer. So in their sharp little book on the triclinium, in which Chacon and Orsini explained Roman dining customs at great length, they claimed that the real point of their exercise, as the quotation at the top says, is to show that at the feasts at which our Lord and Redeemer is recorded to have held while we lived among men, we will find from certain clues that everything was carried out in the Roman fashion. Baronio duly credited not poor Mercuriale, who was furious, but Chacon and Orsini with having made this discovery. Over time, artistic practice partly engorged the antiquarian's discoveries. Mercuriale commissioned Chiguli to produce the first Last Supper with reclining participants, which many of you will know, it's in the Palazzo Doria Pamphili now. And Poussin, of course, always passionate in his professions of historicism, gave the Judaized Last Supper its magnificent canonical form. So you can imagine that Mercuriale was furious when others had seized credit for his brilliant dis demonstration that the past, the Christian past, really was another country. Country. Here were artists behaving like Renan and Mercuriala, who had really been the Renan, not getting any credit at all. That at least is the story as we've had it. But in fact, Baronio's description of the Seder has nothing to do with Roman or Paduan antiquarianism. Neither Mercuriala nor Chacon nor Rossini said a word about Passover or the Seder. And in some sense, it's quite remarkable that anyone would. The Catholic Church of the late 16th century was not noted for its sympathy for Jewish traditions and Jewish scriptures. On September 9th, 1553, Rosh Hashanah of the Jewish year 5314, copies of the Talmud, the fundamental text for Jewish law and custom and ritual, had been publicly burnt on the Campo dei Fiori in Rome, in Venice, and in elsewhere. Thousands of copies, according to our accounts, so that it became very hard for Jews to gain access to the Talmud. Official Counter-Reformation doctrine always consistently confirmed rabbinical scholarship, yet Baronio explicitly said that it was vital to know 
that Jesus and his disciples had celebrated the Passover and that he had drawn this information from what he called the ancient Paschal Canon of the Jews. Baronia, moreover, was by no means the only great cleric who took this surprising step when studying the Last Supper in the 1580s. At the opposite end of Europe's confessional spectrum, in Calvin's Geneva, Theodore Beza, Theodore de Bez, the renowned scholar and longtime head of a company of pastors, published a new edition of his Latin translation of the New Testament with exhaustive commentary in 1589. And that page on the right will give you an idea of the, relation, the ratio of commentary to text in Beza's magnificent book. Beza couldn't have been farther from Baronio. He thought the Pope was Antichrist, he thought Rome was Babylon and the church the whore of Babylon, and he was absolutely convinced that the church had changed radically in dozens of ways, all of them for the worse since Jesus founded it. Yet in 1589, Beza revised his commentary on the description of the Last Supper in Matthew to describe it in terms strikingly close to Baronio's. It's worth knowing, he says, the particular ritual of this sacred feast, very probably as it had been observed from the first entry in Kinta Canaan, from the most ancient writings of the Jews. It is clear from Matthew's account that Christ observed this with great care. And Beza, completely independently from Baronio, but at exactly the same time, offers a very similar description of the Passover Seder. He describes the halach ma'anya, this is the bread of affliction in vocation. He describes, he gives the prayers, he identifies as Baronio did, the great halal, the psalm that you sing, and the psalms that you sing at the end of the Passover Seder. And he listed multiple passages in the Gospels that you could understand only if you knew that the Last Supper was in fact a ritual passage. Passover. So for Beza, the strictest of Calvinists, as for Baronio, the strictest of Catholics, it had suddenly become clear in the 1580s that Jesus followed Jewish law in celebrating the Passover. In a way, it's even more surprising to find these arguments in Beza than it was in Baronio. Beza was a real Hebraist, which Baronio wasn't. His commentary on the New Testament is full of original passages in which he argues that particular locutions in the Greek are really Semitic, that they reflect, uh, that they, they use words in like sarks, flesh, in ways that you wouldn't use in Greek. And this is the beginning of the research that would eventually lead to the understanding that Koine Greek was a particular kind of Greek. So he's a great expert. And he did know that there were people who thought that Jesus had celebrated a Seder. In the first edition of his commentary, he asked a friend, Emmanuel Tremelius, to offer him a short account. And Tremelius, who was a Jewish convert from, uh, from Ferrara, translated a short description of the Seder from Kol Bo, which is a Jewish halakhic uh, compilation. There's everything in it. It's a great title. You know, it's, it's a book you'd really want to buy, right? It's like World, World Almanac. It has all the information about Jewish law very briefly and compactly presented. But Beza printed this not at the description of the Last Supper in Matthew 26, which is where you would look for it, but at the description in Luke 22, where he knew many people would actually never find it. More important, at the end he said, this is the Jews' ceremony. There are some who think that Jesus observed this when he established the Eucharist. But if this is true, which I would find it very hard to grant, Nevertheless, the sacred institution which puts us in possession of Christ must be judged very differently from that foreign ritual and tradition. In the 1570s, the Basel printer Ambrosius Froben set out to print a new edition of the Babylonian Talmud for use by Jews and Christians. Beza firmly opposed this and did his best to invoke the aid of the government of Geneva to prevent this edition from actually taking place. So somehow between the 1560s and 70s and 1589, something radical had happened to his understanding of the earliest moment in Christianity's institutional life. Neither Baronio nor Beza was a philo-Semite. Both saw the Talmud as a compendium of lies and fables. Each of them loathed the other's church. Yet somehow, in 1587, 88, and 89, the two of them recreated the Last Supper in a radically new and almost identical way. How do we account for their simultaneous decision to fly this strange and to most Christians very unattractive flag? Well, in the late 15th and 16th and early 16th centuries, there were some Christians who knew about Passover, but many of them took what they knew as evidence of Jewish malevolence. 
The men who interrogated the Jews of Trento after the discovery of the dead body of the boy Simonino in 1475 showed considerable knowledge of Passover ritual. And as they hung the Jews of Trent from the Strapado, which you see on the right, they asked them very precise questions about the curses in the Passover Haggadah, the curses against Egypt, and whether they were really curses against Christians. This was not a stupid question. They also asked more particularly about the use of the blood of Christian boys for making matzah and for carrying out other magical parts of the Passover ritual. As ritual murder trials spread through Germany, and they did in the late 15th and early 16th centuries, ideas like this spread with them. The convert Johann Pfefferkorn, who in 1589 started a campaign to confiscate all Jewish books and burn them and forcibly convert all Jews in the Holy Roman Empire, did not claim uh, that Jews used blood in the Passover ritual. But in this little Büchlein about how the blind Jews hold their Easter, he offered an account of Passover in which every single feature of the Passover ritual showed the wrongheadedness of the Jews. So the Jews tried to find all the leaven in their house because they didn't know that they should be examining their consciences. The Jews spent extra money to get pure flour to make their matzah because they didn't realize that the pure white flour was an allegory of Jesus and so on, so that the entire Passover Seder simply exemplified the burdensome character of the Jewish law from which Jesus had saved everyone. Yet the coin had another side. As early as the early 15th century, Paul of Burgos, a learned Spanish rabbi turned Christian theologian, used, knowledge of, used his personal knowledge of the Passover ritual to explicate an important point in Matthew's account of the Last Supper. At the very end, Matthew says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Paul of Burgos, in his commentary on the psalm, says this psalm, Psalm 113, with the five that come after it, the Hebrews call the great Alleluia, that is the great hymn, on the night of Passover, when the Paschal lamb was eaten, after eating it, reclining at the table, they solemnly recited this psalm. Hence the line in Matthew 26 must be understood as referring to that hymn, which is made up of six of the psalms. Jesus, after eating the Paschal lamb, observed the accustomed ritual when he recited this hymn with his disciples. The, uh, the, Paul doesn't go further with this, but he does already suggestively bring Jesus' Last Supper into combination with the, last, uh, with the Seder. Dominicans didn't like Jewish rituals and Jewish writings. What Dominicans didn't like, Franciscans liked. And so in 1512, the Franciscan Thomas Murner published the first Haggadah to reach print. It's in Latin rather than Hebrew and Aramaic. This is the first printed Haggadah with rather wonderful woodcuts in which three Jews carry out the Passover ritual. It's an accurate translation. It's not particularly friendly in its commentary, but it simply presents the Passover ritual <laughs> as something which is not accompanied by the sacrifice, which were no longer happened in the Jewish world, or by the shed of blood. A generation later, the Protestant theologian Paul Fagius, who worked very closely with a great <coughs> Jewish scholar, Elijah Levita, went much farther. He published in 1542 a booklet of Hebrew prayers, and the title alone illustrates what he, what he it was, Hebrew prayers that the Jews still use today in their more <coughs> solemn feasts when they recline at table. Uh, and the method, order, and ritual with which they say them. These allow us to see certain traces of the ancient Jewish, of the ancient Jewish ritual, which Jesus, our Savior, also observed in his Holy Last Supper in some respects, as Luke particularly and the other evangelists describe it. So here you had a direct statement that Jesus had carried out the Passover ritual, and in his translation of the Targum, that is the, one of the Aramaic translations of the five books of Moses, you can see on the right that Fagius actually gives you a kind of Passover liturgy. And for a long time, Christians assume that this really is the Passover liturgy. When George Cassander, who was an Irenic Catholic, published a collection of early Christian liturgies, this is the one that he gives first. So the first Christian liturgy is actually the Passover Seder. And then you have the various forms of the Christian mass as he knew them. <coughs> 
So by the middle of the 15th, 16th century, the Seder was by no means completely unknown, and scholars, particularly Protestant scholars, had begun to draw connections between the Seder ritual of their own time and the Last Supper. More generally, approaches to the New Testament had also shifted. Erasmus, great historical thinker as he was, had little interest in or sympathy for Judaism, little knowledge of Hebrew, and made little effort to use Hebraic scholarship in his commentary on the New Testament. But within a generation after his death, scholars were doing exactly that. In 1554, the Italian Catholic Angelo Canini published a wonderful book, or a kind of rundown of all of the Semitic sayings and turns of speech in the New Testament. He starts with words that are actually in Aramaic, like Jesus' cry on the cross, but then he goes into turns of phrase which are in Greek. And he notes that again and again, Jesus and the other actors in the New Testament use turns of speech which are documented in the Talmud as the common speech of the rabbis and other Jews of a few centuries later. For example, Jesus says it's as easy for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven as for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Well, in the Talmud, in Bava Metziah, one rabbi who's making fun of another for saying something impossible says, well, you must come from Pumbaditha, where they make elephants go through the eye of needles. And Kanini says, Jesus, of course, didn't use the term elephant because in Palestine, unlike Babylon, they didn't have elephants. He used camel. But really, you can see him here using a Jewish phrase in a nice proverbial way. It's easy to see how exciting this was. This copy belonged to Thomas Bodley, founder of the Bodleian Library and a very skillful Hebraist. And here you see the three exclamation points that he put <laughs> exactly when he read this. Beza, in his commentary in the New Testament, intercalates every one of these explanations with great respect, even though they're the work of a Catholic rather than a Protestant Hebraist. Even more remarkable is the work of Beza's friend Emmanuel Tremelius. This is his magnificent edition of the Syriac. It's another West Semitic dialect close to Aramaic, but, but historically distinct. This is the Syriac New Testament, or Peshitta, which he edited in 1568, this extraordinary edition uh, in which he gives the Syriac in Hebrew rather than Syriac script, which would be easier for most of his contemporaries to read. Tremelius was an erudite Jew from Ferrara who knew the Talmud extremely well. And though his temperament was anything but radical, he went much, much farther than Canini had. Canini said repeatedly, the Jews can't tell us anything about theology. They can't tell us anything about doctrine. They're just useful for the historical setting. Tremelius, by contrast, pointed out repeatedly that sayings in which Jesus contradicts the Philistines were actually normal rabbinical doctrine documented as Proverbs from the Talmud. So here at the beginning of Matthew 7, judge not that you may not be judged. And here you see Tremelius saying this is a proverbial statement. Uh, and a proverbial statement wholly, uh, wholly like this can be found in the Talmud. And then he gives two examples of Talmudic treatises where you find exactly the same. Again and again, the Philistines confront, the Pharisees, sorry, confront Jesus uh, and denounce him for violating the Sabbath. Well, says Tremelius, actually, the doctrine of pekuach nefesh, of saving of life, means that you never observe the Sabbath if danger will come to a person or indeed to an animal by doing so. So Tremelius, absolutely rigorous Calvinist though he was, fills his commentary with demonstrations that Jesus was in many ways a rabbi of his own time, though in some ways he was not really contrary to the whole flow of the Gospels with their demonstration that Jesus is contradicting the teaching of Judaism. It's an extraordinary thing that he does, and these notes are then reprinted in the smaller 1590 Bible that his friend uh, Franciscus Junius did, and reprinted over and over and over again. These become part of the substance of Calvinist biblical scholarship. And Tremelius also, as you would expect, believed that Jesus had carried out a Passover Seder and explains what that would have entailed in some life. One interesting point is that every one of these Hebraists knew perfectly well that you reclined at the Passover Seder. Even Peppercorn says that. So the antiquaries were two generations behind. You didn't actually need to look at a Roman triclinium to know how Jesus and the disciples would have behaved at Passover. Yet it wasn't any of these texts or new approaches that changed the minds of Beza and Baronius. Both of them read a book 
and the book stunned them and made them think differently. And something of the way that so many of us felt when we read Les Mots et Les Shows in the 1960s. But it wasn't Les Mots et Les Shows, it was Joseph Scaliger's incredibly erudite new work on the correction of chronology laid out in eight books, which appeared in 1583. This book is mostly on the most direly technical questions of dating events in antiquity and fixing and, and reconstructing the calendars of different ancient and medieval peoples, Eastern and Western. But at one point, Scaliger inserts what he calls, with studied academic dullness, the remaining features of the Lord's Passion illustrated. And this digression, five folio pages of Latin, affected erudite readers like an electric shock. In 1583, month after the book appears, Francois Ottmann, great revolutionary political thinker, writes to a friend in Zurich and says, please read that passage on the Last Supper in Scaliger's De Amidazione as soon as you can and tell me what you think about it. Kasaubin, in his copy of the book, which is now in Eton College, writes on the title page, and he always puts the most important thing in a book on the title page, Aurea diatriba de Coina Dominica, a golden diatribe on the Last Supper and the Passover. And what Scaliger does is to describe the Seder at enormous length, and this is just an excerpt from his description. The description is thicker than any other which a Christian had given, that is, it's more precise, and instead of simply being a liturgy, it's a combination of liturgy and description of the action. And what's most remarkable is its source. He didn't use a Passover Haggadah or a prayer book. Instead, he went to the tract of treatise Pesachim in the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, and he pulled out from it, mostly from the Mishnah, the Hebrew portion, which is the oldest part of that, but also from some of the fragments in the Gemara, the later commentary, every statement which described or prescribed an action for the Passover and commented on it. So this is a reconstructed Seder from the 5th or 6th century, though much of it comes from elements from before 200 AD when the Mishnah was compiled. So here you'll see him, you see he, at the very beginning he quotes a fragment, they brought him the matzah and the harosa. That's all there is in the Talmud. And Scaliger makes this the basis for a description of what the harosa is, and then he explains what the harosa is and what the father of the family does. It's a strange description of, of, the, of the Seder, but it is the most detailed the thickest and the one most thoroughly based on the oldest existing sources that anyone had ever given, older sources than any Jew who would have used at this point to describe the Seder. And we know that it's reading this book that blows Beza and Baronio away. We know it from Beza because he says so. I copied part of this, he says, and it was worth doing it from the Deum and Daziona Tempera of my close friend Joseph Scaliger, a man who's never been sufficiently praised for his recondite learning, his critical judgment, and the diligence which overcomes every obstacle. Baronio didn't say it, but every word of his description is copied from Scaliger, including a magnificent mistake, which I'll come to in a moment. And in neither case was it obvious that they would find this brilliant revisionist book by a young Calvinist scholar so convincing. When Beza first received the book, he didn't like it. Scaliger's discussion of the crucifixion, he says, is nothing but impure Judaism, even if we disagree with the Jewish calculations. Baronio didn't mention it at all, and there was a very good reason for that. The censors in the index were attacking the book on exactly this point. We have a, in the first denunciation of Scaliger's book, which is from 1585 or so, um, is the most detailed instruction to readers is delete every word of the section where Scaliger babbles that the institution of the Eucharist was an ancient custom of the Hebrews. So it's quite remarkable that both of these men decided, as they did, to accept Scaliger's argument and incorporate it in these salient works of theology and church history. Why did they do so? Well, I think that one of Scaliger's best mistakes actually really helps to explain this, because it was by making the mistake that Scaliger thought that he could solve a problem which had worried biblical exegetes, New Testament commentators, for a millennium and more. 
One of the many puzzles in the Gospel of John comes in the description of the Last Supper in chapter 13, where he says, Jesus rises from supper and lays aside his garments and takes a towel and girds himself. And after that, he pours water into a basin and begins to wash the disciples' feet. Now, the question is obvious. You can imagine washing the feet of disciples as they come into the house before a meal. <laughs> But why would you wash the feet of disciples who've already been in the house and eaten the meal? They've already tracked the place up. What is it that Jesus is trying to do here? No exegete had been able to come up with a convincing answer, but Scaliger had. Scaliger argues that the Passover meal actually took, took the form of two separate meals, a meal in which you ate the Paschal lamb and then the ritualized meal of the Seder. Um, this, again, is not a stupid suggestion at all, and it's one that actually has foundations in the history of Passover. But he made the argument for a reason that is not so beautiful. He believed that the Passover ritual actually called for washing of the feet. Now, all of you have been to a Seder, or uh, sat through a Seder, or been bored at a Seder, um, and you've all heard the four questions which the youngest Jewish male asks in order to establish the nature of the Passover night. Scaliger translates these in his account, and here's how he translates this, the, the first of them. Why is it that this night is different from all other nights? On other nights, we wash only once, but on this night, we wash twice. Now, what does he mean by washing? He explains, the rules for Passover call for the washing of feet to be repeated. So in other words, this night is different from all other nights because this night we wash feet twice. Not only Jews, but Gentiles as well practiced washing, for since they ate lying down in beds, they first removed their shoes and washed their feet to avoid dirtying the bedclothes. As you all know, the real question is, why is it that all other nights we don't dip our herbs even once, but on this night we dip them twice? And you all probably know the answers better than I do. <coughs> Scaliger simply misunderstood the text, which was easy to do. It was an unvocalized text. He simply took, a, uh, took an active verb for a slightly different reflexive form of the same verb. What's marvelous is that it's by doing that and solving the riddle of John and producing this vision of the ancient Seder as something that includes washing of feet that he convinces his Protestant and his Catholic reader. Beza says, Scaliger has explained why Jesus got up from the table and in violation of the normal custom, washed the feet of his disciples in the middle of the meal and then reclined again. And Baronio says, the Jewish book of rituals shows that it was the Jews' custom at the Passover feast to wash feet and hands a second time. And the clear explanation for this is that the feast had a double meal connected with it. Or to put it another way, one meal with two separate I don't know what I wrote there, sorry. Uh, one meal with two separate settings, in the former of which they ate the lamb, and in the latter of which they performed the ceremony with the matzah. So Scaliger's error, I think, was one of the things that really helped to catch the eye of these skeptical readers and show them that his Jewish erudition would be useful. And in a deeper way, you can see why making foot washing part of the Passover ritual would make it more attractive to Christians to imagine that Jesus had carried it out. The washing of feet as an evidence of Jesus's humility was something that mattered deeply to Protestants and to Catholics. Baronio actually washed the feet of 12 poor men every night before giving them dinner, in addition to writing his church history. So this was a way of creating a, an imaginary Judaism, which was in some ways rather Christian and appealing, and I think that softened the way the entry of Judaism into the vision of Jesus and his disciples' culture. So in some ways, reading Scaliger and reading all these Christians as they recreate the Seder is a little bit like the uh, Martian archaeologist in David Lodge's novel, The British Museum is Falling Down. Some of you may know that early novel of Lodge's in which a British Catholic imagines that England has been destroyed and a Martian archaeologist descends and investigates the rubble in his house and works out that Catholicism is a fertility cult entirely centered on the female ovulation cycle, since the material remains of Catholicism in his house were entirely thermometers and charts by which he and his wife were desperately attempting to avoid making her pregnant once again. 
And the, this vision of, of the Seder has something of that feeling. Scaliger should have known that foot washing was not part of the Seder because Tremelius, in his great edition of the New Testament, says, you know, it's interesting that Jesus washes the feet of the disciples on Passover. You might think that this is a violation of the law, but in fact, washing is not one of the actions that's prohibited by Halakha on the Sabbath or on Passover. That would have been a tip-off if Scaliger had been thinking more, uh, more openly than he was. But it wasn't only Scaliger's mistake, I think, that his readers found convincing. Um, it was that mistake that helped Johannes Buxdorf II, a professor at Basel in the 1640s, to bludgeon him unmercifully because Buxdorf had actually been to Passover seders and read Jewish Yiddish minhagim books, custom books, which described them. He was able to make clear what dipping was all about in a way that Scaliger, without that living knowledge, couldn't do. But there's more to the story than that. What Scaliger does is to use the evidence in a distinctive way. Even Foggius, for example, treats Jewish prayer totally negatively. Note, he says, Christian reader, how the poor Jews ask God only for temporal and carnal things, that they become rich, that they get their land back. Scaliger, by contrast, when he presents the halach ma'anya, this is the bread of affliction, says, the elegance of these words can best be conveyed in Greek. And he translates the Aramaic invocation into Greek, showing a, a sense of this Jewish prayer as beautiful, rather as Isaac Kosovan did when he wrote in his prayer book at the, uh, at the penitential slichot for the day of, a pen, of repentance. What a beautiful confession. You know, there was a certain elective affinity between Calvinists and Jews, at least when it came to guilt. More important, Foggius, even though he believed Jesus had carried out the Passover ritual, had no way to account for change in Jewish ritual except as evidence of corruption. Scaliger, by contrast, as I tried to show before, reconstructs the ritual historically. He finds the fragments of it in the oldest possible source and assembles them in a mosaic. And when he looks at individual fragments, he teases apart their historical layers. So here you see him working on, this is the bread of affliction. The words of the ritual were slightly changed, he says, by the Sanhedrin, the high court, after the destruction of Jerusalem. They read as follows in Aramaic. This is the bread of affliction, which our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt. Every man who is hungry, let him come and eat. Everyone who is need, let him come and celebrate the Passover. Now we are slaves here, but next year we may be in the land of Israel. Now we are slaves, but next year we will be free men. The words that belong to the original formula are these. This is the bread of affliction, which our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt. Whoever is hungry, let him come and celebrate the Passover. Jews who didn't live in Palestine added the rest. So here you see Paul Scaliger finding layers, just as he would have done in a Greek or Latin text, doing a kind of philological analysis that, so far as I know, and this is a statement always subject to correction, no Christian and no Jew had previously applied to Jewish ritual or to other Jewish texts at this time. And I think it's really this rigorous historical method that makes his work so attractive. Instead of saying, look, we have the ritual the Jews follow today, let's assume Jesus did this, Scaliger was offering the closest approximation to the ritual of Jesus' own time by a miraculous piece of fragment collection and philology. And there's evidence that Baronio and, and Beza both appreciated this. Scaliger says, this was the ritual by which Passover was cited at the time of the Messiah, as is clearly proved by the rules in the Talmudic Digest. Now, the Digest is the great, is the great Roman compilation of the opinions of Roman juris consults made in the early 6th century, not very distant from the Babylonian Talmud. He says, unless someone denies the ant their antiquity, which would be similar denying that the chapters of the Roman juris consults quoted in the digest are by the juris consults under whose names they're cited, no sane man could claim this. So he's showing you that it's only by pulling the Jewish source apart, finding its earlier ele earliest elements, analyzing them, then you see the sort of Jew that Jesus was. And this is exactly what Baronio says. 
those who've read the ancient commentary of the Hebrews that they call their book of ritual or ceremonies will clearly understand that the practice of standing, which you're supposed to do in the Torah when you celebrate <coughs> Passover, became obsolete from the time of the Babylonian exile. So it's this historical vision that really makes Scaliger's work distinctive, sets it apart from others, and I think made it carry conviction with men whose prejudices should have led them to reject it. This is, it, this is always remarkable in the history of religion or in the history of scholarship. Now, I think this story has some wider um, implications for intellectual history and the study of Renaissance scholarship. Great books by Paula Finland, by Peter Miller, and by others have taught us to see for the first time the novelty and power of Renaissance antiquarianism, of historical work done from material objects rather than from texts. And that kind of scholarship certainly had its place in the study of the early church. This, some of you know this, this is a page from Giacomo Grimaldi's magnificent survey of the old Basilica of St. Peter's carried out as the Basilica was being torn down. And a great, great work of visual antiquarianism teasing out the layers of the old Basilica from its foundation to the late Middle Ages. But there were Protestant as well as Catholic antiquaries. This is a Protestant antiquary, Rudolf Wirter Hospinian, studying the evolution of temples. And Protestant antiquaries tended, like Protestant, as Protestants did in most areas of life, to believe in texts rather than in objects, to believe that texts were the charters and the strongest evidence about the history of religion. What we see in the story of the Last Supper, though, is something that is not so stark as this opposition. It's a mixture of antiquarian and textual scholarship from two very diverse traditions. They really have nothing to do with one another in their origins. One is, uh, is lay in its origins, the other ecclesiastical and theological, one material, one textual. Yet they come together in the most extraordinary way in the 1580s. And one of their results is particularly striking, I think, from the what I think of as the barred standpoint. In the 1580s and 1590s, antiquaries are very interested in food and eating. As Michel Jeanneret shows in his wonderful book, Les Mets et les Mots, antiquaries like Wilhelm Stucki of Zurich and Rudolf Wirth wrote these massive studies on rituals and feasts in the ancient world. They take advantage of material evidence, they take advantage of textual evidence, but the most striking thing is that both of them include the Passover Seder as a cultivated ancient feast, along with the, Jew, the Greek Symposium, along with the Roman Supper. They have detailed accounts of the Passover Seder. So they imagine the Passover Seder as a dignified, civilized form of social life. They put it, indeed, in the case of Hispinian, in the context of the Greek Symposium. And in doing that, they're in advance of modern biblical scholarship by about 350 years, because it would take David Dauba to make this argument again after World War II. So here you see, it seems to me, a story in which antiquarian scholarship, though partly inspired by material objects, is really transformed by textual studies in a way that the object alone would never have made possible. And it's in the, one of the reasons to study the ecclesiastical world of scholarship is precisely that it's precisely there that this kind of mixture of traditions with explosive consequences took place, since in studying the history of the church, you inevitably had to deal with both objects and texts in as rigorous a way as you could. The last question, the one that I wish I could answer most com really completely, is what it meant existentially to imagine that Jesus was really a Jew, that Jesus' disciples were Jews. Leo Steinberg knew what it meant to believe that, but I don't know. I mean, Leo knew a lot of things that I don't know. Uh, <coughs> what we can say, I think, is the following. It's an approach that scholars find very attractive. And in the 17th century, many scholars go down the same path. Gerald Toomer, in his recent book on John Selden, says, just as a matter of obvious fact, Selden treats Christianity as a Jewish heresy, a branch of Judaism. That's a normal <laughs> approach in the 17th century. It's abandoned in the 18th for reasons we don't really fully understand. So it proves attractive. But why? What did it mean? And it's here that Scaliger is most fascinating.
On the one hand, in the 1580s, studying the Passover ritual, he clearly did not ask a Jewish informant or a convert to help him put these texts together or tell him what dipping and washing were about. But by the end of his life, when he ref he's still reflecting on and expanding on this treatment, things are a little bit different. Talking to his students, he had students living with him in his house, which is a wonderful house in Leiden. It's now a karate school. Um, which oddly has the words Pax Week Domili, peace on this house, over the door. And you go by and you hear screams and blows. At all ends, he would sit with his students and he'd talk to them about his past. And there are two things he says that I think shed light on this story. The first is that he mentions going to Avignon in the late, 15, in the late 1580s, after he had analyzed the Seder, and talking to a Jewish woman there. He says she was a very learned woman, highly literate as Jewish women are, poor but well-dressed. She was willing to eat lunch with me, uh, but only fish, not meat. And she tells him a story about why the rabbi in Avignon was so stupid. Um, Avignon, of course, was tightly controlled. It's a very tiny Jewish community, just really a few alleys, um, very, very strictly ruled. And she says, so, you know, we were under papal control. We didn't want to have a good rabbi here. He might have been forced to convert. So we took the stupidest guy in Avignon who had a good circumcision, and we made him the rabbi. And the rabbis are his descendants. So Scaliger laughs, whereupon the woman says, and Scaliger recalls, don't laugh, sir, your Jesus was circumcised too. And this story seems to have made him reflect in a deeper way on what it meant that the Last Supper was a Seder. And I say that because in other comments to his students, he says, you know, some of these Jewish rituals that Jesus performed were very good. I think we should have retained them. I think Christianity would be better if we hadn't so completely abandoned Judaism. Unfortunately, he doesn't tell us what those are. Now, I strongly doubt that either Beza or Baronia was tempted by a vision of a Christianity refreshed by eating matzah for Easter or something of the sort. But there is a deep story here of prejudices overcome in order to establish historical distance that hadn't been there before, of scholarship and loathing for most Christians felt that of Jews, somehow intersecting in a creative way, and of Calvinist and Catholic scholars and the Jewish convert Tremelius coming together in a strange intellectual commensality in the moment when Europe was worse split by religious war than it ever had been before or than it would be again for decades to come. It's an extraordinary story, and I hope in a small book to lay out all of its ramifications and implications. For now, though, I would be grateful for comments, explanations, and particularly anyone who knows anything about foot washing at the Seder.